those of you who are tuning in with us now, my name is Matt Cameron. I am the Region 4 Outreach and Communications Coordinator. Um, and Region 4 is the eastern part of Tennessee, and uh, I can do the fun stuff like uh, like classes and um, talking to the news media, which can be fun and can be not so fun, depending on what the subject matter is. And uh, keep up with social media, and uh, that can be a, a blessing and a curse as well. So uh, anyway, get to, to communicate with uh, hundreds of anglers across the state. So that's part of what this is about. But uh, we're almost uh, almost six o'clock here, uh, Eastern Standard Time, five o'clock Central, and uh, we'll give it another minute or two, and then we'll we'll kick off. So we had uh, about 150 people sign up for the class today, Steve. That's a that's a lot of people, you know, especially you're reaching a lot of people is what that says especially through your media outreach because like you had said before uh, we first started these you know with you know the pandemic and uh, how life was going with everybody i know you've done a couple of these and we, we had 40 50 people to the first couple of ones and then it just keeps getting bigger and bigger which you know shows the kind of outreach you're doing you know especially not only in region four but for the whole state as well so yeah, yeah we got a good crew across the state got a lot of a lot of knowledgeable people and uh we love to network with uh, with our hunters and anglers. I mean, Steve here is he's a walleye angler. That's how I met him. Was was fishing out on Douglas and uh, started spitting snow that day. We were the only two idiots out there trying to catch walleye. And, uh, he came by and he has a really nice walleye rig. I'm in a flat bottom, you know. Uh, my son and that's what we have. And um, my sons, I've had I have two, but I was out there with one son that day and he came by in a, in a nice walleye rig. I'm like, this guy knows what he's doing. I'm gonna see if I can get to, get to know him and. Uh, Steve uh, hooked up with me and did a video, uh, Drop the Tailgate, a little video series I do on it's basically a how-to type series. And he took me out walleye fishing a couple times there, and we might talk about that a little more as, as we get going here. But we're about one minute uh, after time, so we're kind of going to jump into this here, and I want to welcome you all to uh, the virtual class on walleye fishing basics. And uh, my name is Matt Cameron, and uh, if you're just tuning in, I am just in communications here in East Tennessee, and uh, Steve. Steve um, Paul is a friend of mine that I met fishing on the water, and uh, there's another Steve Paul who's an angler that caught the state record muskie. Is that right? Yes, he did. It's not me, so don't confuse him with me. <laughs> he, might, he might be a little upset about that, but yeah, he. Uh, I think he does a little guiding for uh, muskie um, around you know the Knoxville area. I think he's you know from south of Knoxville somewhere, Maribel, Louisville, something like that. But yeah, we get confused a lot. I get messages sometimes on Facebook asking me if that's a, if I'm him and some pointers. Yeah. And, you know, I hate to disappoint people, but I got no clue how to fish your muskie. So, well, it's a different story, though. Well, that's good. That's what we want to talk about today. So, uh, can y'all hear us? Okay, uh, we've got a chat. If you don't mind typing in um, that you can hear us, that you can see us. I know our screen went black a minute ago, and we'll we'll get rolling with this. If, if anybody, Kevin Couch and uh, Kevin Vargasan or Vargasan had already uh, commented, and somebody just jump in and make sure that everything's rolling, I would appreciate that. And if you all would, thank you very much, Kevin, and. Uh, if y'all don't mind um, uh, telling us where you're from and uh, where you fish at at some point during this because we want to talk about um, your, your bodies of water and Steve fishes all over. You know, I'm a I'm a Douglas Lake, French Broad River walleye angler. If I can even call myself a walleye angler, I guess I can because that's what I like to fish for. But Steve fishes all over and um, he fishes up in Lake Erie and we want to talk about that as we go too. And before we get too far into this, I'll forget to do it if I don't do it now, but you know, we think of walleye as a northern species of, of fish, you know, and you talk about walleye, it's cold water fish and think about other states. You don't think of Tennessee as being a walleye state but that is yeah. not the case is it no it's not i mean um like you said you, you talk about walleye and i think that's kind of a little bit of a misconception though is everyone thinks well that's a cold water fish it's a cool water fish you know so that's why they do well we are on the southernmost range of you know natural um natural walleye habitat i think tennessee is the most other state that does have natural walleye um but like you said a lot of people don't think about it that way you know but we've got We've got a couple, you know, giants that have been caught here, and you know, I think you were going to show them, you know, 
one of the giants that was caught here in Tennessee. So this is crazy, y'all. But uh, this is a replica of the world record walleye. Okay, this is caught in Tennessee in 1960 by Mabry or Mary Harper. I've seen it spelled both ways. I think our records show Mabry. I thought maybe that was a man, but I believe it was a female. Uh, Mabry or Mary Harper, 1960 on uh, this Old Hickory Lake fish. Is that correct? Old Hickory Lake. Yes, so. somebody type in, tell me what it weighs. I know y'all walleye people <laughs> will. I'll give you a minute here, but people look at this. When we take this out and uh, on on trade shows and outdoor uh, shows, hunting and fishing shows and whatnot, we hang this thing up. It takes people a while to figure out what it is because they don't expect a walleye to be this big. But this thing is uh, 25 pounds, 3 ounces, and this is supposed to be a replica of the actual measurements of that fish and that's a behemoth now when you first showed it to me you know i was like that's not a walleye you know <laughs> did not believe it but i mean it's got all the characteristics you know it's got the dorsal fin and obviously the teeth so you know that that's a big thing is the sort of between those and like i said it's just that's just one giant fish um to tell you how you know we talk about northern states and how their walleye you know walleye states pennsylvania which borders lake erie just had their state record broken 15 and a half pounds you know that's all it is but i mean <laughs> that's still 10 pounds you know just under 10 pounds less than what you know tennessee holds is the record so it's i don't see that getting broken anytime soon i don't either that's it's been over half a century since uh, this fish was caught and i'm sure they ate it back then there's a picture if you'll <laughs> if you'll google mabry harper walleye you'll find pictures there's only a couple pictures that exist of it but it'll show her with the fish and uh, i'm sure they took this thing home and and ate it you know back then i've heard some stories about some guys bringing some giants out of rock island state park and you know other guys saying you guys need to go get that thing weighed to see what it is and they're like, no interest it's going home for, it's going home for supper tonight you know and so that's just kind of how it's been you know it's more or less walleye has been a staple of food for uh tennesseans versus you know like a sport fish as you would say in ohio minnesota wisconsin those northern states um you know we've got the well, as you can see, I don't know if they can see it above me or not. Just barely. The uh, world record smallmouth above us out of uh, Dale Hollow Lake, you know, one of an amazing walleye fishery as well. Um, deep lakes, you know, so I guess that's what we're going to talk about today is how to fish these, you know, deep lakes and reservoirs that we have in Tennessee because they do differ from the northern lakes a lot because, you know, where I'm fishing at Lake Erie, you know, you're most of the year you're fishing 25, 35 feet um, lake you know portion of the lake you're really not moving out to that 70 80 90 feet of water that we see here on a, on a regular basis so how, how do you compensate for that that's the big thing um, kind of like what we were talking about too is fishing a tournament up at Lake Erie this year um, we were with the master walleyes tour and the director when he was announcing us coming up on stage was like oh out of Knoxville Tennessee do you guys even know what walleye are <laughs> how to remind him yeah we know all our the world records out of there and he came up afterwards and was like you know did not realize that you know and so that's kind of where it's a foregone thing you know a foregone fish because we have such great fishery otherwise small mouth large mouth crappie everyone kind of thinks of those warm water fish right here and they just kind of forget about the wall but you know you, there's a That's lot shame. of bass fishermen that <laughs> you probably take a bass fisherman and he'll teach his class a lot better than I can because <laughs> he probably catches a lot of them that's where we'll start then I had somebody uh, message me this week and said I've always wanted to know how to catch those fish on purpose yeah. and and a lot of the, the officers I work with you know I'm, I've fished for a while for a while but in the summertime I don't really know how to catch them you know other than the spawning run I'm like where can I go catch some from all out there like go bass fishing you'll probably catch them so can we start with that for those of y'all who are just getting into walleye fish or maybe fish for a while um you know how do you target walleye specifically because i don't have the first clue other than during the spawn and run how to target these fish well um a lot of your summer fishing matt comes from uh, top water bites um fish are chasing same thing that's why a lot of bass fishermen are catching them is because they're fishing the shad spawn okay right and so they're fishing at night you know under a moon or under complete darkness and um they're just slow rolling top water baits and um a lot of those you're catching bat you're going to catch a lot of small mouth you want to catch walleye and if you ever hear that there's a distinct noise of walleye it makes when it hits the top of the water. 
distinct sound. So when you hear that, you know, it may throw you off kind of what actually it is, but typically it's a walleye coming up because they don't bust the water like a small mouth or a large mouth would. Okay. As they come up, they're, you know, inhaling the water and that bait into their mouth and it causes, you know, that, that friction that busts the top of the water causes that sound. So um, one of the baits, and I'll show you, is a very popular um, very popular bass bait, but this is all a spook right here. Um, Switching over to this camera here as we keep having issues. So, so you got the Zara spook here. Um, that color, a red head with a white body, is very, very popular. Um, this is a, an old, old school bait. Old right here. school I mean, bait, but I mean, decades you know, old. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right, man? That's the thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's why this thing's popular. Exactly, because it works. Um, another one um, that we use here is the red fin right and they come in jointed or they come without joints or anything and some of them as you can hear this one's got rattles right, right. and some of them don't have rattles um dale hollow uh better have a rattle right if you okay. want to fish dale hollow for whatever reason they like having that sound that rattle there you go go, go, to, hollow fish room. go to north rattle lakes. okay you better not have a rattle really yep you I catch more on catch more on any baits that don't have any sound to them at all they're just okay. breaking through the water okay. i don't know why you know and but it's just you fish a ton of different baits throughout the night and uh you know you'll kind of do that but also when we're looking at summertime fishing as well we talk about our deep lakes, you know, you, you go out to what Norris is at the deepest point, what, 200, 200 something feet. It's a deep, cold lake. But we have, we have a thermocline that sets up throughout the summertime. Right. Very few fish can survive below that thermocline. So what you want to do is turn up your, your sensitivity on your graph if you're on a boat. And um, you'll be able to see that thermocline on your graph where it starts. And that's where you Explain want to start. Explain what the thermocline at. is. Basically, the thermocline is a point of the water that um, no more oxygen is underneath that. The uh, plants and the vegetation that are underneath that water have used up all that oxygen. And light isn't able to pen penetrate any further below that. So there is no more oxygen. And there's a huge difference in temperature. And that's why you see it actually show up on your graph is because it may be 55 degrees at the thermocline where above the water you're at 72, 73, 74 degrees. So having that um, dissolved oxygen, not having the dissolved oxygen and what keeps those fish above it. Now you go up to uh, Watauga, even down at Dale Hollow and you start fishing some of the trout that they have, those fish will stay below that thermocline. They can survive in that very low oxygen water. And they do well in it because it's cold. Um, but the walleye, they, the walleye, the bass, they typically like to stay right above that. And that's kind of what I use as my, as my ceiling or as my floor, right? Okay. Um, and this is for daytime fishing. And what we are going with daytime fishing for walleye during the summer, I love the cool spoons. And when people think of spoons, they're thinking of jigging spoons. I'm thinking more of a trolling spoon. And it's a salmon, you know, it, it got its popularity um, fishing salmon, right? And then, um, but they noticed up north that they were catching a lot of walleye while they were fishing salmon, they were fishing for salmon. So it's caught on and I like to use them. Um, if you see, this is a stinger uh, spoon. You get a bunch of different custom colors, uh, but typically, you either want a copper back or a uh, uh, silver back, right? And you, you're going to use those different colors on different days. Like if it's sunny out, you know, I'm typically with the copper, you know, maybe copper on the sunny days. And then on the jolly days, you're getting a little more flash with that, with that uh, silver backing, you okay. know, try to try to draw those fish in because a lot of our lakes are, are really clear. I think uh, Norse Lake, um, you, you can see a pretty good ways. And so when you're fishing those, you can draw in some fish from in pretty good ways as long as you got a big flashy bait. Another, um, bait, you, you say pulling these, you controlling these behind your boat? Controlling like those behind the boat. Um, on a planer board? On a planer board. Um, but the, here's the issue with these is they don't dive, right? So we have to get them down. And whether we're using a dipsy diver or a 
a tadpole weight or we're even just running a two ounce inline weight and just snap these down. Um, I use an app called Precision Trolling and it what they have done is they have gone through and calculated what depths everything and what speeds a lot of baits and weights and everything else run. And so that gives you an idea if you're marking fish at that 25, you know, 25 foot mark or 25 foot depth and you're fishing at 15 feet or you don't know where you're fishing, then you're fishing, you're not really fishing for the fish. You know what I'm saying? You're just targeting. Kind of guessing. You're kind of guessing. Yep. So that's why I use line counters. Right. Um, I calibrate my reels every year, every spring. I'm going to start calibrating my reels here soon um, because the trolling season is kind of going out right now. But, you know, that we're getting into that jigging season now. But then when we start trolling again, I'm going to recalibrate my reels. Everything's going to be kind of fine tuned. That way I know if I'm marking fish at 25 feet, I know I'm putting the baits right in front of their face. You know, and the big thing is always fish above the fish, though. Never fit, try to fish below because okay. the walleyes, their eyes kind of sit on top of their head a little bit so yep. they can look up yep. you know and they're a predator fish so that's what you always want to fish above them never below them great great information and precision trolling if y'all are into technology and apps and stuff pick that one up i got that one last year after i fished with you yeah get it on your uh, your smartphone and um you can pull up put in your specific bait and it'll it'll tell you um you know how deep it'll run and how much line you got to let out and all that kind of stuff and once again uh, line counter reels are important for for trolling uh, i got i picked up a couple of okuma i think magda pro line counter reels yeah. last year after i fished with you and they're very affordable and i uh, found some good um i think they're from Daiwa trolling rods i think they're on 50 bucks a piece eight foot six inch telescoping you, you don't have to break the bank to get a decent trolling rig and i mean you don't need a lot either i mean if you're fishing long our state the uh, daily limit is typically five fish, 15 inches, um, 18 in some parts of the state. But um, you can pick up two or three rods and you can get the combo set um, from your local outfit or wherever that is. And they're typically, you can get it for less than, less than $80 typically. Um, so it's, it's very inexpensive to start the trolling. The biggest thing is having the boat, being able to trolling motor, the kicker motor that, that really goes along with that. So um, while we're still on summertime fishing, and I'm not going to get all these out, but here's my, this is one of my boxes where I do all my worm harnesses with, right? And on a worm harness, we're using a three foot lead, uh, some beads, some colorful beads, some blades. Um, and then we're, all we're doing, it's a two hook, um, it's a two hook loop or rig that we're setting up. And we're trolling a crawler behind it. And it just gives that crawler a big, you know, big profile. And for whatever reason, that during the warm water seasons, that tends to be your, you know, your big one. I know um, Dale Hollow, for example, usually about that middle of May into August and September, most of your fish are caught off worm harnesses. Norris is the same way. Um, How deep are those fish? That time of year it just depends on what the thermocline is. It depends what thermocline is. That thermo thermocline is going to start to set up and come up higher in the water as the year progresses. Um, so you may see it at 40 feet to start out with, and then as it gets up. Another way that I, I typically target walleye is when you're graphing, look for shelves, look for flats, you know, something in that range that's in that 25, 30 feet. That way the fish don't have to suspend, they can kind of lay on the bottom. You know, if you've ever noticed a walleye, when you pull it up out of the water, it's kind of flat on the bottom, you know, and that's kind of right. what they do. They just, lay on people the don't think of them as a bottom fish, but that's what they do. They kind of just lay there on the bottom, you know, waiting till it's time. Um, and you'll see, um, if you're marking a ton of fish, right, uh, you'll see those fish laying on the bottom. But then as feeding starts and your bite starts to pick up, you'll actually see them fish start separating from the bottom a little bit. And that's what they do is they're coming up off the bottom and then they're going into their feed mode. So pay attention so, to your graphs and when you see yeah. them picking up off the bottom. Yeah, when you see those marks start to come up off the bottom, you know, a foot or two, okay. get those baits right there next to them because they're they're going to start eating. So, and they kind of do that as they, they progress throughout the day. They start feeding and then they'll move up into those banks where they're pushing the shad up against the banks stuff and whether you're fishing with one of the lures we talked about earlier or you're dropping a green light out and in that green light you're you know uh, stinging shad snagging shad or just jigging some spoons out there that's another great way to do that is drop a drop a green light or a blue light or a, a white light and um 
the shadows start circling that light and then the fish is just kind of like a buffet for them they come up and you know start picking them off you sting some shad drop them down below the rest of them and it's typically a good night and you'll catch i mean i do a lot of crappie that way too you know come out home with a mess of crappie and walleye but typically i'm after the walleye so i'll turn down either one they're both yeah, exactly table fair and for those of y'all who've never caught a walleye or ate one learn how this is your year you want to learn how to catch walleye <laughs> well let's let's jump back to you know fishing the thermocline and, and when we're fishing that thermocline um just make sure that you use that as your as your floor right and try to find the fish above that um but what we can do is since we missed all that let's circle back around to that um but we will uh, let's get on to where we were just now kind of this winter time fishing then we'll kind of go through the seasons, right? Sure, absolutely. And then we can come back through into that thermocline fishing and stuff like that. That way, um, I know with our biggest point is, is like you said, is, hey, it's deer season's about over. Fishing time's about to start, start for yes, a lot sir. of people. So, you know, kind of get into that. So uh, what we were talking about was um, fishing a lot of these lakes, these uh, river systems that we have throughout Tennessee. Um, with the spawn coming up, the fish are going to spawn, you know, that 45 to 48 degree temperature range, right? It's going to come down as the water starts to climb back up. They're going to start looking for the spawning areas. The river systems we have, and that's where a lot of those walleye migrate up the river systems, and they kind of um, congregate up there in the schools and such, and they, you know, shot, are spawning in those one to three to four foot of water, right? But they're staging until they get up there. So that's what we were talking about was. <clears throat> how are we catching fish right now right and catching fish right now is these berkeley flicker shads right trolling these up or if we're jigging but we'll get into jigging in a minute so talk about trolling berkeley flicker shads um you're trolling them at you know 1.5 2.5 miles an hour uh, up or downstream you know typically if you're going downstream make sure you're trolling a little faster because you have to compensate for that current moving down as well. So maybe in the three and a half, four mile an hour if you're going downstream. Um, another good bait you can use is Wall and Nation Creation makes a shaky shad. It's a good bait. Um, there, there's a lot of them out there, but the reason these are so popular is these kind of mimic our thread fin, which is a huge food source for these walleye, right? And that's why they do a good job of doing, um, of working there. With these um, colors we had talked about, Fire tiger, fire tiger, purple tiger, anything that's kind of a chartreuse, an orange, a purple, so on and so forth is what really, you know, is what really catches a lot of the fish. Um, fishing below these dams on the Tennessee River, you know, you take take example, the French Broad. There really is no <clears throat> where you can get to on the French Broad may not be where the fish. Is. Are, are stopping, right? They can get it a little bit further. Obviously, we have landmarks that stop us from getting up there. But let's move down the French Broad, right, to the Douglas Dam or the Fort Loudon Dam, the Watts Bar Dam, right? Those are man made barriers. The fish can't get any further up those. So start using those areas as your stopping point for where, you know, you're fishing. Start fishing there and just kind of move down the river a little bit, you know, because those fish are starting to move up to migrate now. And so you'll find them within a couple miles of the dam. I'd be surprised, you know, a lot of the dams though, as well, they hold fish all year long. So you're probably catching those resident fish as well as the fish are starting to migrate up, up the river as well. What I've seen with, with walleye fishing is um, if you, you get in the general area, you can kind of watch and see where the boats are and, and take it from there. So it's, it's not super rocket science it's just you got to be in that general vicinity and, and watch and learn watch what the other guys are doing if they're catching them trolling try trolling for catching them jigging go to jigging and uh you can kind of get out there and rub elbows with them and it's a very um uh, social type fishing you know in general uh, people in don't general, seem to... um i've met some people that uh that typically do not like to talk when it comes to water right? right? because all i fish in tennessee is a secret you know, no one wants to let the cat out of the bag. And I understand, you know, you, um, especially with Facebook and, you know, everything going on nowadays that people feel like their holes are getting fished out or anything. But trust me, with the natural reproduction and, I mean, how many walleye did you say um, you guys stocked this year? Yeah, this is, this is crazy, y'all. Uh, TWRA has stocked 2.1 million walleye 
into Tennessee waterways and across the entire state. That's just in this year alone. We always get asked, you know, why you stock trout all the time? Why don't you stock wild? I want you to start uh, stock this certain species of fish. We are stocking a lot, a lot of walleye. So they're they're out there. Um, and hopefully by the time we get done today, we'll hopefully show you some spots where to go fish them. Now, we do have some diagrams we're gonna show you in a little bit, Steve. Uh, he, he, he doesn't care to do it. He says probably a lot of people are going to hate on him for doing it, but we're going to show a few uh, graphics of where you can go and, and catch wildlife. If you're not familiar with these, these certain, I um, won't call them uh, community holes, but I guess maybe that's what they are. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're well known for the local area that they're in. You know, okay. it's, it's no, if, if you live in you live in Rogersville, you know where to fish. Melinda's Ferry. Yeah, yeah. you you, fit, you, uh, you live down in uh, Sparta, Tennessee. You know Rock Island is where to fish. Okay. You know? It's just... If you don't live around those areas, you may be wondering, well, where am I going to catch fish at? Where do I even get started? Where do I even get started? Yeah. So that's kind of where we are today is, you know, to help people learn how to catch these fish. Um, back to what Matt was saying about the stocking program, though, all that information is online on your guys' website. You can go on there and find out how many fish, how many walleye did they stock in my specific lake. Um, typically, I've noticed that um, the survey samples, when they do – they, they base the stocking off the survey samples where they, you know, what kind of fish they're getting and such like that. Douglas Lake was never really stocked at all. I had a very good, very, you know, healthy population right. of fish. And they even still, it's minuscule compared to what they do with the rest of it. You know, they may get a 10, 15, 20,000 fish that they stock in Douglas compared to Norris that's going to get 200, 250,000, you know. So you can see where they're stocking the fish and maybe, you know, base, base your, uh, your fishing off of that um so all right so we talked a little <laughs> bit about trolling in general um I, we mentioned planer boards that's probably when the audio went out yeah uh, i picked up a couple last year really don't know exactly how to use them yet i've got the idea of it getting the baits out away from your boat especially if uh if it's shallower water Does that, yeah that help? um especially clear lakes you know like like your dale hollows and your norris lakes that are i mean super clear especially during the summertime um those planter boards, one, they help organize your lines. That way you're not getting six rods tangled up right behind your boat. The other thing about it is, is they get those away from the boat. You know, you're, you're not casting a shadow from your boat onto these fish. You know, they may be a little, a little finicky, whereas they see that shadow and they, you know, they dart off somewhere or, you know, they hear yeah. the motor or something like that. Whereas you're able to get, you know, with planter boards, you're able to get your fish, your baits, good ways from the boat. I mean, you're kind of limited here because of the way the reservoirs are set up. But when we go up north and fish Lake Erie, you know, we may have a 100, 125 yard, you know, setup going on with all of our boards and stuff we're running out just because we're trying to get as far away from the boat as possible. Oh, and that's goodness. kind of where you want to be at is if you notice those fish, you know, you're not catching a lot of fish and you're kind of fishing the middle or the edge of the bank, try scooting over the middle and send those boards out to the bank. And see if that makes helps you know make a difference get your baits away from the boat and see see if that helps at all so but uh like we're saying on trolling right now is a good time to be trolling these these flicker shafts right and matt had, matt had said before the audio went, or after the audio went out how do you determine if you want to jig or if you want to if you want to troll um typically the way i figure that out during the day is i troll up the river and i jig down the river and i kind of find out where that bite is at that day it's am i you know going to be um as i'm coming down am i just wasting my time jigging because i'm really not catching anything but every time i go up and get a fish or two then i'm going to focus on just trolling you know um same thing if jigging you know i'm catching everything on jigging but you know the water's just that we've you know had a lot of rain and you know the water's not working well it's a little dingy we're getting all that trash in the water the weeds and everything moving down and all your baits are fouling out why keep you know working that system your head against the wall. exactly yeah. right so kind of find out what's working for you and kind of do it fast and just stick with it and then when conditions change you know just be very adaptable make sure that you bring a lot of your baits with you um, that way you're not limited to just jigging or just trolling or anything um, now getting into jigging Matt the biggest thing is that what I like to do and I think a lot of people have an issue is um, not having the right setup Right. Um, me, I like to use a six foot six medium light rod paired with a, a slightly smaller reel, kind of like a one that I like as a Fluger Presidential or a Mitchell 300 or a 308, something a little bit smaller. You know, we're not 
coursing in 20 pound catfish or carp or anything. Speaking of carp, you'll you might catch a couple of buffalo out there that are fun. <laughs> They're pulling uh, some drag, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, I think you got one on video last year, some guy doing that. Oh, yeah, but, that's uh, right. Pulling the clinch. But um, kind of the other thing is, is using a, you want to be able to feel them fish because they're going to hit that typically they're going to hit that jig on the drop right and so if you don't have a sensitive line such as a a braid or a fluorocarbon you may miss those because mono tends to stretch a little more so what i do is i run 30 pound um 30 pound uh, power pro braided line and i use an eight pound fluorocarbon leader and the reason i use those two specifically is they're the same diameter okay right and so that way when I'm tying my lines together, there's no big difference in diameters and line. Gotcha. So um, that helps. I usually use a fluorocarbon leader, probably four feet, something that I'm not reeling up into the eye of the of the rod, but yeah. it's still enough that you know I'm, they're not seeing a, a braided line coming down. Okay. So it's all about the presentation then with a yeah, fluorocarbon exactly. leader. And, and this, if you break off, you've got still got a piece yeah, or two you can exactly. retie. Exactly. You know, I might go down to I've got a foot left. You know, and that way I'm not dealing with that. But this right here is probably when we talk about jigging. Um, this is what everyone uses right here. It's called a hair jig. Um, a lot of guys here in East Tennessee, they make them. It's just a lead jig with a hook. And um, that one right there is made by a friend of mine, uh, Mr. Stephen Chris. I'm not too sure if he's still making a lot of them or not. Um, but there are a lot of guys around the area that will make those. It's a simple lead head, a jig, and that's deer hair. To be honest with you, that bucktail is, jig. Yeah, bucktail jig. That's I think that's where they got the name from. Um, but uh, you can also order, you know, online. Um, if you search a lot of places up north, you know, you can probably get them pretty good. If you don't have anybody around here, I've noticed that kind of, you know, the Bass Pro or the areas around here. If you go to like the little bait shops mm -hmm. around, they typically have them. But if you're trying to go to like, you know, Bass Pro or Academy or something like that that's in the area, they typically don't carry that kind of stuff because of the area we're in. Those those uh, box stores are really more towards bass fishing or crappie or panfish here. Unfortunately, right? yep. Unfortunately, you know, we're trying to change that, but, you know, it, it's going to be a process. So, um, honestly, and I haven't pitched this yet, but you can go on Facebook. I run a Facebook page called Tennessee Walleye Fishing. There's a lot of guys who make those and will sell those on the page, right? And so you can get in touch with them, get a good, get a colors, a variation of everything um, there. Now, one thing that's really come along, and we don't see down here, Matt, is ice, right? Ice fishing. We don't, you never want to see the river over here um, freeze it, over. It might right? freeze over, but you're not really going to fish it. Yeah, exactly, it right? So up north, they started using, they started noticing that when the water got cold and ice was off, they started still using ice fishing jigs, right? And that's kind of where I'm at with these two and done really well. You know, typically I, I jig two rods. I'll, I'll jig one of these and I'll jig a bucktail jig, right? And usually I do pretty well off of these. Well, this is a, this is Walleye Nation Creations Rip and Wrap, right? Uh, it's a seven eighths ounce jig. And the reason I believe those are, those, with these jigs, you're not causing a lot of action, which is up and down, up and down, and you're letting it pound the bottom. And those fish are seeing that, and they're coming around, they're hearing that, and taking a look at it. With those, you can really work some action into them. You know, the darting, the, you know, really mimic a dying fish, right? Now, I think that's really why those, those fish tend to key, or, or, you know, key in on those a little bit better. I know you said you haven't really had a lot of luck with them. You know, I've only fished them a couple times. A couple times, yeah. And, it may not be the same for everybody. You may, you may not like them, you know, but I, I typically like them. Um, here's Rappel, uh, Rappel's um, Jig and Wrap. It's kind of the same. I think they were one of the first ones to kind of get into that. Um, one thing I don't like about them, I do and I don't like, is they got that front hook on there, so it tends to get snagged up a little bit more, but also you can put a, a minnow head on it, right? And that some, some days, typically these jigs are fished with a, with a tipped minnow, right? Other days, their fish bear again you know just variety you may not catch any with a minnow you may all come off of a bear jig you may not catch a fish on a hair jig and just go straight to a straight plain jig with a minnow on it you know there's days that that does better than everybody else if you're <coughs> if you're out on the water and everyone's catching fish but you obviously something's not right right <laughs> so move around you know 
give different presentations, talk to the guys, you know, typically a lot of guys will help you out. Um, some guys, they'll, they'll kind of just look at you and they'll steer you in the wrong direction. But most of the guys here in Tennessee, they, they typically, they're, they're wanting to help out because you know what, they were where you were one day, you know, way back when. Absolutely. And uh, so typically that's, generally you find nice people around here, so. For the most part, and I should talk about what I do like about these two is that, that back hook. I uh, can't tell you how many times, and, and I've been walleye fishing maybe seriously for 10 or 12 years, walleye and sauger fishing, and that's primarily what I would fish tip with a minnow, but I can't tell you how many times you get one up and, you know, just that the tail of the minnow's been ripped off or the whole minnow's ripped off where they're, they're short striking them. You know so, how to fix that, right, Matt? Stinger? Stinger hook. Tell them what a stinger is. Stinger hook is a... Uh, you typically a six or an eight, uh, number six or number eight, uh, uh, treble hook, treble hook that's uh, tied on on a little leader. What it hangs out probably an inch, inch and a half, two inches behind there. I usually run it through the tail of the minnow, just kind of keep it so it's just not wildly flailing, you know, wildly flailing around. It's stuck there, right? So when that fish does come up, it just grabs the tail because the walleyes are known to short strike a lot. They typically hit their baits, let them die, and then you know pick them up again. Whereas, so when they grab that tail, just kind of short strike it, they're grabbing your your stinger hook. You know, and there's been a lot of days where you catch a lot of fish on stinger hooks. Um, again, um, probably with stinger hooks, going to need to check out a lot of the local areas. I know um, um, I probably should get they should pay me once I name their name, but I know Tom's up in Morristown. If you're around the Morristown area, they have a lot of stinger hooks. You know. Um, I know that because I've usually I make my own, but in a pinch I'll swing in up there if I'm sure. in Cherokee or Douglas or something like that and grab a few, you know. But um, a lot of your local bait shops that are specifically they know what the fishermen are coming in for the season. They typically stock that in there. So uh, get some stinger hooks, add them to your jigs, and you're probably going to catch a lot more fish. Um, now, Matt, we've been talking about boat fishing, right? And maybe a lot of these guys, the reason they're tuning in is because they don't have a boat, right? Mm -hmm. And they want to fish Been you know, there. on the bank, right? I was there for a long time myself, right? The best places to fish um, right now for these is we've got a lot of river access areas um, up on 25, on the Clinch River, 25E, or um, I think it's 25E, right? right? You can access a lot of that area all the way, you know, and then you can access it from... Um, um, coming down, there's a little road there that has the boat ramp off the TWRA boat ramp. You can access that whole riverbank there, and it's, it's a really good place to fish. Um, Their Beach Creek is it? Yeah, where Beach Grove. In? Is it Beach Grove? Beach Grove yeah. Okay. Um, around Beach Grove, uh, same thing. Earl's Holler. I see a lot of guys lined up around the banks around there. Um, but honestly, probably the best place would be below the dam systems we have. Um, I know a lot of guys they're um, fishing below. Um, Douglas or Fort Loudon or Watts Bar Dam. I see a lot of them lined up against the banks and stuff like that. And they do pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, on my Facebook page, there's a uh, guy that fishes more south, you know, Chickamauga and, and further south of there. He does really good. Um, and I know for a fact he just bank fishes. He does not uh, fish from a boat. And I mean, he every time you can look at some of the pictures he puts up on there, I think his name's Simon. And uh, he really puts a hurt into the walleye below the dam systems and so and typically what he's using is just a three eight ounce jig head with a cur with a curly tail grub on it you know a wide or a short truce or something like that just taking it against the bottom um same thing i like when i do that because i do do that um i i've gone down below the uh, mountain hill dam do pretty good down there and um same setup six foot six rod you know some some braided line fluorocarbon leader and uh, be able to do it that way. Um, a lot of those guys down below the dams, they fish at night as well. And again, when they're fishing at night, they're fishing topwater baits, jerk baits, you know, the thunder sticks, bizarre spooks, you know, anything that's a, a floating Rapala or, you know, anything kind of floating bait, um, they'll do pretty good along the banks they're fishing up there. Is And you, I'm sure you've seen it before is, you know, when you're bank fishing, and boat fishing, a lot of the boats tend to come to the bank to fish because that's that's where they're at. You know, they're going to use that structure, you know, to uh, to orient themselves there. So um, don't be discouraged if you're uh, if you don't have a boat. These are still 
plenty catchable fish, especially um, might need to do it more during first thing in the morning, last thing at night or overnight at the dams, but they typically, there's guys who do really well doing that. Um, uh, another really good place to bank fish, uh, Rock Island State Park. They've got a spot up there that you can't get to by boat because there's a waterfall. But you go above that waterfall and you fish up there. I think it's called the Blue Hole or something like that. And a lot of bank fish run up there. Now it's it's a steep walk down there, you know. So if you catch them, if you do pretty good, you might not like it going back up. <laughs> so um, good problem to have. Yeah, it would be a good problem. But uh, again, those boats can't get up into there, right? So it's really a bank fisherman paradise gotcha. because they aren't able to get up there. So. Um, Matt, we got any questions or anything? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna look back through here. There's been several people comment about where they fish, <laughs> where they're interested in fishing. Um, uh, Chickamauga, talking about catching walleye there, but hadn't keyed in on them. This is Kevin Couch. Um, he's fished a lot of small lakes in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan walleye, but everything on this lake seems to be different. Any help, tips, particularly for this lake, would be appreciated. Do you know much about walleye? So, I'll tell you, here's what I know about Chickamauga. Right, it's a bass lake. That's where all your double Digit bass really come from is chicken water. Yep. However, there are walleye there. Okay. And a lot of people, when I think of Chickamauga, just because I'm not a real big bass fisherman, I don't go down more than two or three miles below the Watts Bar Dam because okay. once the water leaves the Watts Bar Dam, it's, it's considered Chickamauga, right? And so that's where the key in on right now. I know there's guides. Um, I know a couple guys. You go on my Facebook page, you'll see. Um, you'll see guys who are fishing the Chickamauga below the Wasbar Dam. There's a boat ramp there. Fish from the boat ramp up to the dam, trolling. Um, right now they're doing really good trolling flicker shads. Um, and then as the season progresses or as the water kind of cools down a little bit, we'll go more into those uh, those uh, jigging patterns and such. But right now they're doing pretty good trolling, um, uh, trolling flicker, flicker shads down there. So There you go, Kevin. Um, I'm going to share a screen for just a second. Uh, this is... Um... A few things that uh, there's maybe Harper and her uh, her state record world record walleye there, but I want to show you uh, some forbidden stuff here that that Steve said he might get some hate on, but uh, if I can get him to pull up here. We'll take a look at them. All right, this is Watts Bar Dam boat ramp, and you've made a mark on it right here. And I'm gonna try to zoom in a little bit tighter on this, but Steve has marked right here in this red line places that he's caught fish yep. before. Kind of go down to that outlet from the. Um from the nuclear plant there, there's a water outlet. And if you kind of use that as a reference. Here? No, go down further. Down? There. Yeah, go down a little bit further. See that little- Right here? There? Yeah. So kind of start there and and move up if you're fishing there. Now, if you go back up towards the dam, you'll see that there's the uh, lock system, right? That lock creates a break wall and there's a rock wall that comes out there. And it's a point, right? This? Yeah. So those fish will sit in that, in that break water, right? out of the current until it's time to feed and then they'll start moving in there so if you use that that kind of that break wall as a line to where you're at on the bank you'll mm -hmm. be pretty good so. okay excellent let's see what else uh you've got another one i think for watts bar if i'm not mistaken yeah watts bar below the fort loudon dam that'd be uh it'd be this one right here yeah same thing there when you um when you go down below that dam there, you can see that break wall uh, coming off the dam right Over here. here. Yeah. And there's a little hole there if you're on your graph. And that hole, those fish sit in that hole kind of out of the out of the current. And as you know, as they go to feed and stuff, they'll start moving in the current. But you jig that little break wall there, you do pretty good. Um, trolling's pretty good, still up through there through the dam. Generally, we like to see, you know, a gener one of one or one or two generators going kind of give a little bit of flow, but sometimes Watts Bar is, or sometimes uh, Fort Loudon, they, they tend to let loose and it becomes unfishable, but uh, gotcha. um, typically one, two generators do pretty good. Um, Matt, if you zoom out or go to the other screen I sent you for Watts Bar, and this is where I'm going to get a lot of hate. If you have a boat and you put in there below the, um, is it the Teleco Dam that feeds in right there with it? Oh, that's that's a Chickamauga. There should be another one. Um, you put it in there at the tip of at the. Uh, maybe I didn't. Okay, I didn't. I probably didn't give you that graph. But what you do is you put it in there at the Teleco, right below the Teleco Dam. It feeds into the uh, Watts Bar Lake or the Tennessee River, right below the Fort Loudon Dam. 
if you run down a mile, maybe you're going to see a little A-frame house up on the left-hand side, right? When everyone's talking about the A-frame, that's what they're talking about. I mean, it's everyone asks, why do you call it the A-frame? Well, when you get there, you're going to know it's because that house is a perfect day. Okay. And so that's where a lot of guys are jigging, right? And what it is is on the backside, as you're drifting down there, it'll drop into a huge hole. So as long as you stay above that hole, typically, or skirt around the edges of it, you'll do pretty good jigging. Um, I know a lot of guys um, that they'll go all the way down to the 75 bridge. So pretty much from the 75 bridge, which is in Loudon, um, if there's a ramp down there. You can fish that as well. So you can put in the Loudon ramp and run up to the A-frame and fish that all the way down or you know, troll or however you want to do it. And, uh, they're doing pretty good right now. I've seen some guys uh, talking about how they're catching some fish right now. The fish are starting to move back up into the uh, river systems, and uh, they're starting their uh, they're starting their run right now. So, okay, good stuff. All right, let's see. Thanks, Kevin. I said another one of uh, Watts Bar Lake, which we just talked about. That was William uh, Douglas Lake. Um, let's see. Yeah, let's talk about Douglas for a second. Well, Douglas is right down the road here, and Douglas is a very good. I like Douglas for the simple fact that you always got a chance at the solver. You're going to catch a lot of solver there. Um, and then also just remember that you can only keep one solver over 16, right? And then um, you can get your other wall. You can keep solver smaller, but I mean, sm solver are more of a pencil fish when it comes to walleye. They don't really have that, that big you know, girthy, belly, girthy and belly or anything like quality that. Quality so to them. Typically, you know, get your one solver over 16 and then rest your walleye. And the reason for that is to explain real quick is our fisheries biologists uh, wanted to encourage natural reproduction of sauger on Douglas Lake. So they allow you to keep one nice big sauger if you catch one, or they want you to put the smaller breeding size fish uh, back in. So that's that's the idea behind that. <coughs> but um, they have a really good ramp there. The, um, uh, the Walters Bridge access area, as you can see there, that is a very good ramp. It's a two boat ramp, a very nice parking lot. Um, be right here. Yep. Fish from there. Um, you can fish that bluff all the way down to uh, Taylor's Bend. Really did some good point eighteen bluffs down there. Um, those fish are probably going to be around there first. Obviously, um, now would probably be a good time to fish there. Swan's Bluff further down. Um, I'm over in Newport. I got a friend that lives over there, so I go over and visit with him a lot. Here recently, when I've been coming over the seven or the uh, forty bridge. I'm seeing boats stacked up down there on the Swans Bluff right now. So it tells me either one, they're catching walleye, or two, they're catching crappie. And you're going to get a mixture of both when you're fishing down there. But it uh, seems like a lot of guys are starting to fish that. Um, that point 19 all the way up to um, Rankin, right, is really good uh, come January. January, February, you're going to see a lot of fish up that way. Um, it's really going to depend. Last year, we didn't do as well in Douglas because – Believe it or not, it didn't flood, right? A couple years prior, two, three, four years ago, we had a consistent flood every year. So we were able to get up into, into Rankin, Leadville, you know, all that kind of stuff and really did really good on walleye. Um, last year, we didn't get that, that rain that really provided that. So we didn't get up there too far. And it was staying in typical river fishing 15 foot of water. It was more like three or four, right? And so... Um, just kind of watch the water and how deep it is. If, if we're still, you know, below full, full pool like we are now, we're going to fish around that Walters Bridge access area. Um, but if we start getting some heavy rains and, you know, and they pull, bring the lake up to control the flooding, by all means, start heading up to Leadville and uh, Rankin area. Um, that is another good spot for uh, bank fishermen. Oh, yeah. Too, because it is so shallow up there. And there are some deeper spots in there. If you go up to Rankin, um, You'll see them if the guys are up there fishing for bat or white bass. You're too late. You already missed it, right? So try to get up there January, February time frame, early February, and uh, fish those you know those uh, grubs or you know a jig with a minnow on it or something like that. Because come uh, come late February, March, that's where a lot of guys will be hitting those banks for white bass up there. So, but again, that's a really good spot if you're a bank fisherman. And on up in the summer, they catch uh, fish up here in yeah. the French Broad. A little further on up trolling <laughs> so the warm harnesses yeah warm such, harnesses right? yeah we'll put in at rankin or we'll put in at leadville or i mean even walters bridge you can't go wrong putting in there and uh, we'll go up there um a little bit of grass grows up up there in that rankin access area and so we'll troll um uh, warm harnesses through that may june july time frame and do pretty good 
Um, I guess that's kind of a misconception because these fish, right, they start to migrate up, up the river, but not all of them leave. And the other part of it is, is after the, after the, um, after the spawn happens, typically we start to, you know, TWRA or TVA typically starts put, putting water into the reservoirs, you know, holding water back. So those, those areas where that were three, four or five feet deep are now going to be six, seven, eight, you know, 10, 15 foot deep. And so those fish are going to, those fish are going to kind of stay in that area. I've noticed that around, um, they start dropping the lakes in September around Labor Day. That's when a lot of those fish start to move down the rivers is they follow that as the water gets dropped, they kind of follow along with that. And then they turn right back around in December, they start moving up. Pull it back upstream. up. Yeah, moving back upstream from the, so they kind of follow that, that depth, right? Again, because, because that, what we were talking about earlier, the thermocline, right? Because in the river systems, you're really not having a thermocline set up. A thermocline is going to set up in a, in a lake where there's not, really not a lot of current. Right. And so they don't have to fight with that thermocline or anything else like that. So you'll see a lot of fish that kind of migrate with the water as it, you know, comes up and down as well. So. All right, let's take a look at some more um, Norris Lake. Uh, of course, you took me up there and we fished the Clinch River <coughs> part of it. As far as the lake fishing goes, I have no clue. Do you want to talk about the lake part of yeah, it or the, um, the river? I'll, I'll talk about both, but let's hit on the lake since it's down there, right? Okay. Um, Anderson County Park, really good spot. Hit some of those clay banks that are, that are red clay banks and that water kind of, the during the summertime especially, the um, the butters in there kind of muddy that water up sure. because of, you know, coming in and out of there. You fish that mud edge right there because Muddy water is actually a little warmer than clear water. So is it, it kind of like because a darker shirt absorbs it, heat, it absorbs so heat the darker water is going to absorb the sun exactly. energy? So they'll, they'll kind of hang on that real, that edge of that muddy water and do really good uh, trolling crankbaits and trolling um, worm harnesses. Um, right around, so around the Anderson County Park, look for points, uh, windswept uh, points, uh, mid-lake points, um, voice and sea, right, point 19. Yep. That is, when you talk about lake fishermen and, and walleye on Norris, point 19 is where it's at. Okay. Um, a lot of guys, I troll point 19. I like those little islands that are down there. And I'll troll the sides of them during the summertime and catch a lot of walleye. Um, a lot of guys, though, they, they like to uh, fish at night. And what they'll do is, you know, they'll slow troll with their cast and they're, you know, they're throwing stick baits and, you know, um, the SAR spooks we talked about, thunder sticks. They're throwing those at nighttime for them, you know. That, it's a blast, but you know, I'm I'm kind of one of those guys that like my sleep, so I'm not out too at night too much. Um, now, as um, more places to fish, let's go up the Powell River, right? Um, Earl's Holler. I actually grew up over in the next Holler, Long Holler, so I know okay. Earl's Holler pretty well. Okay. Um, there's a boat ramp back there. Um, if you haven't been there in 10, 15 years, it's actually a pretty nice boat ramp. It's a single boat ramp. Um, you'll be able to get into it pretty well. Um, go down the river. Um, I think it's about two and a half miles. Go down the river and then fish up. You'll see um, um, if you go down a little bit further than Long Holler, they start fishing up that way. Trolling right now is pretty good. Um, a lot of guys do pretty well around the around the uh, not too far down from the uh, the boat ramp itself. Uh, jigging when that comes in, probably you know later this month, early January. Um, over on the clinch side. We talked about it, 25E. Right now, Island F, um, kind of where the fish hang out on that side of the lake, um, all the way up, and then you're gonna start getting up into the um, 33 bridge. Um, that kind of, right now, I wouldn't go anything below the 33 bridge, and I would stay up more towards, um, kind of where Indian Creek comes in um, to the Clinch River. I would you know, try to stay above that. The Lone Mountain area, actually, that's where that's at, is the Lone Mountain area. Okay. Um, so if you're fishing from Lone Mountain all the way up to um, to Beach Grove right now, you're probably doing pretty good. Point thirty two, point thirty three. Um, um, you know, the summertime, Lone Mountain is a very hot spot. There's a uh, along the railroad tracks right there. There's a big flat that sweeps along there that I do pretty well on. Um, so <coughs> yeah, Matt's got a Matt's got a uh, map up here. This is the Clinch River at the 25E bridge. Um, Beach Grove is probably going to be your better access, which is down the river a little bit. 
because that uh that access road there off the 25e bridge that that ramp is just a dirt ramp up here yeah so if you've got a like a little john boat or something like that you're going to be, be pretty good if you got my boat i wouldn't recommend going up there just because you're going to hit some rocks or something i think this might show it a little better no um, that's the same it's one just it? down on the bottom of that there Yeah, I don't think I've got the, the map I was hoping yeah, for. But it's right there at the bottom of there. Um, if you look up, um, TWRA has an interactive map um, online, and it shows you where boat ramps and such are. If you put in there and uh, look around the Thornhill area, you're, you'll see the Beach Grove ramp. And uh, it's just, when you first see it, you know, it looks like a little dirt road that crosses a little creek there. But once you go around the bend, it opens out pretty well. And uh, there's a good boat ramp back there. I'll show them what I do have right here real quick. Oh, this is, thought I had this up for y'all. I apologize. This is a little boat ramp he's talking about right there. If you got a John boat, you're pretty good putting in right here and you can navigate up and down through here. Uh, but on downstream, I'm sorry, I don't have a graphic of it, is uh, Beach Grove access and you can get a bigger boat in there and go all the way down toward, uh, is it Lone Mountain that's on downstream from there? Yeah, Lone Mountain's further down, uh, point thirty two, thirty three is down that way. Um, you know, that's something we haven't talked about, Matt, is uh, I got a lot of guys down that way like to pop flies for walleye. Hey, talk about what, what that is. That's something I've never done. So um, I'm, I don't do a lot of it just because I've just never fished that way. But, I, you know, I've done it here and there and had some guys show me what it is, is they're using a little little doll fly, you know, like you would a crappie fly or something like yep. that. What they're doing is they'll cast up the river while they're drifting down and they'll just pop those flies. They'll let it hit the ground. They'll you know, three or four jerks, and then they'll let it sink again. Three or four jerks, they'll let it sink again. And there's a lot of guys who do really well doing that. Um, again, making sure you're you're kind of matching, you know, what kind of bait fish are in that area right now, smaller, you know, with those jigs being a little bit smaller. Um, you know, I think point thirty two, um, they do pretty well around that, kind of in the February time frame, January, February. Um, you don't see as many guys doing that as you will see them jigging or trolling uh such uh, and you'll catch them you know a lot of guys do it for crappie and walleye down there so you know you'll do pretty good you might get a mix of both fish so nothing wrong with that no, not at all um, all right let's see <coughs> cookville del hollow cordell hall kevin is asking about that do you know anything yeah. about dale hollow yes um dale hollow is probably my favorite lake in tennessee and it's not because of the fishery or anything else like that dale hollow is just a gorgeous lake to be at I mean, it is, it, it's a site, if you haven't been there, you need to go there. Now, when we're fishing walleye right now, it's tough. You need downriggers if you're going to fish the lake. Um, you need to go to, um, I would say, little repelliminos that are probably in this size range right here, two, three inches. You're going to need some downriggers to get them down there. You're going to fish those big bait balls that you're marking on your graph, right? Okay. Um, they're going to be in the 55, 60 foot because we don't, have a, we don't have a thermocline right now, you know, because the lake is turned over. And um, so that thermocline's gone. It should be, should be gone by now. If not, it'll be very soon we'll have that uh, turnover. And um, so fishing those those big bait balls, you know, and dragging, you know, uh, stick baits through them will do pretty well. I've also... I've also ran flicker shad down there, you know, on a, on a downrigger or a dipsy dive or something to get them way down there and caught them pretty well. Um, for you guys that like to jig or you don't have downriggers, the East Fork River, right? The East Fork Gobi River. Um, if you go up past Sunset Marina and you're going up towards Eastport Marina, um, there is a couple bluffs along the walls up there that are, that are river systems that do pretty well as well. Um, I've heard some guys doing well right now trolling, but um, make sure when you get up that way that understand um, there are no treble hooks that you can use past a certain point there. So make sure you just check the regulations. Um, typically when I see that regulation, it's because, because the fish like to stack in there and they don't want them snagged. Uh -huh. So you have to use a single hook um, up past, it's one of the bridges there. I forget exactly which bridge, but if you go up the East Fork River, towards Eastport Marina, kind of past the marina, and uh, fish up there, you'll, you'll do pretty well right now, so. Uncharted um, territory summer, for me. Dale Hollow, summertime, you want to be down towards the dam, though. You want to be down towards uh, Big Goat Island, um, fish kind of the points, you know, the backsides of those. Um, Divers Island's a good place to start. Uh, 
Lilydale. There's a big bluff on Lilydale that holds some walleye during the summertime. Um, but you want to kind of be further down the river system there. Um, another thing when you're fishing big lakes like that, there's some guides out there, you know. Um, try to get one of those guys to take you out, you know, or get a group or something like that. And they kind of, you know, they're when you pay somebody, typically they're gonna they're gonna teach you how to catch fish or right. you know, just just go out with them and kind of mark that. But they're gonna fish the same exact areas I'm telling you right now. Um, Trooper Island's another place over on Dale Hollow. Backside of Trooper Island, there's a bluff that they like to fish um, for walleye. So, um, I heard a guy could be money well spent. You know, yeah. you're paying them for that that knowledge and that trip, and you know, you can. Not everybody can go out and replicate. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those guys. And I think Kevin. I think his name was Kevin. Had said uh, about fishing a lot of inland lakes up in Michigan. It's yeah. really the walleye fishing is really no different in the technique. It's just finding right? where they're at. Okay. You know, and getting those places where they're holding at, you know, find those sandbars, you know, Big Oat Island, there's a big, um, on the other side of the bank from Big Oat Island, there is a big, uh, like a kind of a gra gravel area that's got weeds in it. Um, during the summertime, those fish hold pretty well up in those weeds. So fish the top of the weeds or find that weed bed and fish the sides of it. You do pretty well. Um, big Oat or Goat? Big Goat. Goat Island, big okay. Goat Island. Uh, you know anything about Cordell Hall that you, you want to mention before we um, move on? So Cordell Hall, I've heard a little bit about it. I've actually never fished Cordell Hall, but everyone I've talked to about Cordell Hall is um, fishing up near the, uh, on the downside of the dam. Now, and Cordell Hall is actually, I know it comes out of um, Dale Hollow, that, that river feeds in and the Cumberland River out of, um, out of Cumberland Lake in Kentucky. Once it comes down in the Tennessee area, I think it's considered Cordell Hall. But um, a lot of those guys are fishing um, kind of around the, uh, um, if you give me a minute, I'll be able to remember it. But there, there's a boat ramp there right around, uh, right off of 40 in the Monterey area that does pretty well. Um, again, a lot of those guys, I don't fish over that way, but if you go onto like the Facebook page or, or something like that, there's a lot of guys over there. I think Melvin fishes over there a lot and uh, he's pretty good and, you know, doesn't hide knowledge or anything like that. So he's got a pretty good area that he'll help people out and stuff. So again, you know, don't be afraid to jump on there and ask some questions, you know, there's people from all over the state that'll help out with that, so. Yeah, well, I don't want to, uh, to dwell too much on on any one place, but they're throwing a few more out here if you don't mind talking about them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, see Becky Bowling, Matt Bowling talked about Norris Lake and Clinch River, which you went over. Uh, David Dawson's asking about Maryville, Fort Loudon. Um, Fort Loudon, you know, that we, we didn't hit on Fort Loudon. We didn't. No, Especially so we, we talked about the dam, right? But, Correct. you know, below the dam's technically Watts Bar, so above the right. dam, right? Where are we going to fish above the dam? So the place I know is at the Forks of the River Forks up there, the, the river, spawning run. Forks of the River. Yeah. So, um, you know where Hidgem's Nature Center is? Iams. Uh, Forks, yeah, is Iams. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> no, that's how everybody calls that's it a, that. That's that East Tennessee uh, literature there. Um, Iams um, Nature Center on the back side of that. Um, Forks of the River there where the uh, Holston and the French Broad come together. Um, very good fishing there. Again, some sauger, some walleye. Um, How far up from the forks right there do you, you fish on either river? I typically range? don't go above the forks. Okay. Uh, I know some guys who do. Um, I'm just not big on it. Um, it starts to get shallow in some places up there. So I'm, you know, not having your graphs only go so far, especially on these river systems. They may not be too accurate based on where the water is. Sure. I know there's a water offset, but if they drop five feet down at the dam, it, they probably didn't drop five feet at the, at the top of the water. Sure. You know? Makes so, sense. Um, same but, techniques um, right through there. Yeah, and I if you're fishing that area, uh, put your uh, there's a boat ramp downtown Knoxville, uh, right under I think it's maybe the Gay Street or the or South Knoxville Bridge. South Knoxville yep. Bridge. Yeah. yeah, I think it's Ned Border Park is what it's called now. Yeah, yeah. There's put a boat right there. Run upstream. Put your boat. Put your uh, boat in there and run upstream. It's a not a far run at all, and uh, do pretty good that way. Excellent. Yeah, Kevin Harmon's talking about uh, wildlife fish in Minnesota, Canada, Green Bay. You've not figured out Tennessee, living near Watts Bar. Okay, I think we, we talked about those. Cherokee Lake, which we, we went over there. Yep, Melinda's Ferry. So I had a, to the, um, 
I had a graphic for uh, Melinda's Ferry, but I don't know what I've done with it. Let's see. This is when we went dead and everybody's slamming us rightfully so. I'm <laughs> sorry I didn't pick up on that sooner. We got very caught up. Uh, talking about the blue hole there. Blue hole up there on uh, Rock Island State Park. So uh, kind of near Sparta, Tennessee. Um, it's part of Center Hill Lake. Okay. That's another one, Center Hill Lake. Um, uh, a lot of people don't uh, consider Center Hill being part of that, but there are some good fishing in Center Hill. It's probably not as good as it used to be. That's what a lot of the locals say. But if you hang around um, Big Island, I think that's what it's called, um, down by Hurricane Marina, which is up from there. Uh, during the summertime, trolling in, there's some brush that hangs down into the water, and they're trolling around those brushes in 10, 15 foot of water. Wintertime, I'd be going up the um, McKinney Fork, I believe what it's called, that goes up to uh, Rock Island State Park. Last year, we talked about the floods, you know, how we didn't get really a lot of rain up in East Tennessee, but I know it, at one point, Kenny, or, uh, Rock Island State Park was completely underwater. The park office and everything yeah, was completely underwater last year. And when I'm talking about completely, I'm talking about the roof and everything. So um, just, just be careful when you're out there, you know, fishing and stuff and make sure you're looking. But yeah, that blue hole, um, that's where, like I said, boats can't get up to the blue hole unless it's been flooded. Okay. So a lot of bank fishermen, you know, that, that's what they'll go and hit that blue hole. So. Got you. I know the audio is an issue and I apologize. We've had technical difficulties. Um, Kevin is asking about Kevin Harmon. Is the A-frame area on Watts Bar considered spawn, spawn or pre-spawn fishing? Um, both. Um, you're going to, what happens is since Watts Bar is going to hold sauger and walleye down there. And so um, some of these fish are going to move at different areas or different times, right? The sauger will probably going to start moving up typically around the same time. But I've noticed that from January until, you know, first week of March, you're catching consistently catching fish there. Um, but they, they are going to move up. Some of them are going to just spawn there in the rocks and the sandbars and stuff like that. Um, but as the, as the year goes on or as the season progresses, that's when you kind of move up to, uh, to the dam and fish the dam a little more, um, kind of in that later March time frame. But the, the A-frame is a really good spot. Um, typically, summertime, the 75 bridge there, um, from the 75 bridge up to Staley's and then um, um, the A-frame. Uh, during the kind of during the winter time, typically holds a lot of the walleye. So, got you. Let's see. Um, troll down river from the dam. So somebody popped in here. Jordan Wyman, telling everybody to do that. I'm not sure exactly where you chimed in at. I apologize for that. And uh, we'll, we'll do one more thing here. And if there's something else hits you, we'll talk about it. We're going to try to wrap this up. But he says, when you circle back to talking about the thermocline, will you explain how to identify how to tell what depth it is? Okay. So, you know, let's circle, let's kind of talk about going into other fishing, you know, because we're talking about the spawn and everything else like that, right? Um, as spring comes up, you know, we're going to start trolling a little faster. The fish are going to become a little bit more aggressive and stuff like that. That's where we start using what's called a walleye, it's a bandit, it's a walleye bandit. Um, typically, that's our May to the October, November time frame is what size baits we're using. Um, a lot of guys do really well on all the lakes around here. Um, I like to, I have a ton of custom colors. Um, I think colors catch more fishermen than they do fish, but it's mm -hmm. fun to be out there and pretend that they do, right? Um, but that is your, that bandit when it comes to summertime fishing uh, from Lake Erie to Tennessee, that is going to be your, probably your best, best bet to go to. This catch fish typically all year round. So when we start talking into fishing summertime and fishing these baits and stuff, we're looking at our depths, right? And the thermocline, and like we had talked about, and I'm not sure if this is before or after, but just a brief synopsis of what the thermocline is. It is a, um, where there's no more dissolved oxygen or very little dissolved oxygen below that level. The plants and everything that live below that area have used all of that. The light's not able to penetrate. Um, and so what that causes is, it causes a temperature difference, and that's what you can see on your graph. So your graph is picking up that temperature difference because because the water's denser, right? The water's most dense at, I think, 39 degrees. So as it warms up, it becomes less dense. As it cools down, it becomes you know more dense. And so you may have a 20 degree difference two feet below the thermocline as far as two feet above the thermocline, right? And so on your graph, you just want to turn your sensitivity up. 
right? You're gonna start seeing a lot of feedback and stuff like that, but go up on your on your on your graph, turn that sensitivity up until you see a pronounced line come across your graph. It's usually gonna be in that 35, you know, 30, 25, anywhere in that area. That's where that is gonna set up at. And when you see that pronounced line going across the water, you know that that's the thermocline, right? That's your temperature change, your water density. Um, and then you can back it down. Typically what I'll do is I'll go up to find it and then I'll back it down to where it's real faint because when you go up on that sensitivity, you're also missing on the, um, you're gonna get a lot of misread the fish. If you're just looking at arcs, you may, you may be seeing, you know, some, some disturbance in the water that you think the fish or something like that. So you always wanna fish with the least amount of sensitivity that gives you what you can see the best. And so barely turn it down to where you see, barely see that thermocline, but you're able to still recognize fish. Um, Again, use that thermocline as your floor, right? A lot of walleye, they may be right at the thermocline, but they're not going to go below it. So yeah. find your fish that are, you know, hanging off there. We talked about fishing flats, kind of in that, you know, if the thermocline set up at 25 feet, pull out a graph or a map or a contour map of the lake and try to find those, those flats and those, you know, uh, sandbars and everything else that's in that 25 foot range and kind of target those you know those fish are going to lay on the bottom that's why they're kind of flat on the bottom they tend to tend to like to lay down there um so again use your graph find that thermocline and then fish from there up and then also you may not want to fish right at the thermocline put a put a spread out you know if you're at 25 feet put a bait at 22 feet you know and then put a bait at 18 feet and then put a bait at 12 feet just kind of all throughout the water column and see where those fish are active at because just because you're seeing fish down there doesn't mean they're going to be an active fish so um, kind of spread it out tune in you know hone into where you're at and um, and you should have some pretty good luck there so did i explain awesome. that enough for the thermal climb uh, i hope so didn't get any more questions about it uh, if y'all have anything else for steve chime in right now any other bodies of water we didn't talk about i'm sure if he knows them he'll he'll be glad to share with you um just don't want to don't want to bore you if we get uh, off on something that's not not important to you just let us know what y'all want to hear if you don't have anything else you will we'll wrap it up um i'll i'll watch it here for a minute or two but i did want to uh, you to remind people of your, your facebook page and the, the walleye fishing uh tournaments you know there's not just bass tournaments or walleye tournaments and all the opportunities that there are yeah, out there you know, here's the thing about tournaments is I fish a tournament series up in Lake Erie just because it's more pronounced, it's there, right? But it's a good way to get out and learn other ways to fish, right? You're talking to guys at the ramp before or after. You're seeing what they're using, how they're successful. Um, but, you know, there are also some tournaments here in Tennessee. Uh, we hold some on the clinch. You know, local rivers like that, you know, we're not out um, fishing all day or, you know, putting two or three day on big money tournaments. But it's something you see a lot of these rodeos or something that goes along around bass fishing. It's kind of like... Kind of in the sense of that. So um, uh, when they do that, a lot of guys will post on the um, Tissy Walleye page about you know when and how they're doing it and all that kind of stuff. But more than anything, it's more of just a chance to get people out to learn. You know, hey, this is how you do it. You know, getting to do the real life stuff versus just watching you know us out here doing this. So gotcha. All right, how about lead core line? Lead core line. Um, they're really trying to test me right now. I think they're just checking my knowledge. Yeah. So uh, lead core line is a line that is a it, it is a it's got a lead core, but it has a sleeve like a I don't know what the material is if it's a nylon or what kind of sleeve is on the outside. And what you do is it it comes in different colors, right? You'll have on one spool you'll have a bunch of different colors, and each color um, is five feet of uh, diving ability. So if you put out one color, you know that that lead core. If you take a bait that's not a diving bait, such as this spoon here, right? And I put out one color, then I know that one color has got me down five feet. If I put out two colors, I'm down 10 feet. Three colors um, is uh, uh, 15 feet. But you also have to know at what speed you're doing it to. And that's where that precision trolling app that we had talked about comes into yeah. because it'll tell you like, hey, you know, the lead core might be, you know, five feet per color at, you know, 1.5 miles an hour. But what happens when you kick up to two miles an hour? You know, where, where does that put you in that in that um, in that uh, water column there? So just make sure to be the, to be successful when you're trolling. You have to know what depths your baits are trolling at. So having a good good calibrated line and also precision trolling runs off of ten pound mono. 
So you don't have to run 10 pound mono, but try to find 10 pound mono, standard 10 pound mono has a diameter, right? Try to find uh, lines that are within, you know, re very close to that diameter. Right. And you, they'll still act the same way, still be within the same range, just because that's what, that's what uh, causes the diving dis or, um, is the friction of the line, right? So the faster you go, the more friction on the line, more bow in the line. So if you get it around the same diameter as what 10 pound mono is, standard 10 pound mono, then you'll kind of be on that same curve as well. So makes sense. All right, let's see. Let's take one more question or so and we'll move on. That was a great explanation for Thermocline. Thanks for everything. Even though they were technical difficulties, y'all did an awesome job and I greatly appreciate it. Stay safe and good fishing. I appreciate that. I appreciate Steve coming in and, and sharing knowledge. I know this guy could probably talk all night about walleye fishing, but it's, it's been a pleasure. Man, I'd like to tell guys out here, I don't, I've had guys approach me, ask me about guiding and stuff like that. I don't guide because I like fishing, right? And when you start to work, I don't think it becomes enjoyable anymore. But you know, I've taken you out. I've taken, sure. you've probably seen a bunch of people on my boat when we've passed each oh, other yeah, out. Oh yeah, every time. So if anybody, you know, you're wanting to learn a body of water, or you just want to get out and do some walleye fishing, reach out to me, you know, if I'm available and I've got a seat in my boat, you're more than welcome to, you know, run along. There's times that I'll see guys bank fishing it when I show up at the boat ramp, say, you guys want to go fishing? They'll say, heck yeah, jump in the boat. And, off we go, you know, so and that, that'll also, you know, help others, you know, hopefully that once you learn what's going on, you know, you can teach others as well. So absolutely. It's important that you share knowledge with people. You know, a lot of anglers and hunters aren't like that. You know, they've worked hard for that knowledge and uh, ability and they don't want to share it with anyone. But um, I'll tell you anything I know which isn't much and Steve's willing to do the same. But if people want to get in touch with you to ask you questions or uh, give you give them pointers or anything, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Um, you probably prefer? Facebook, Facebook Messenger. You know, if uh, you see if you join the page or you see me on there, just look up. I'm an admin on there and just reach out to me. And Tennessee Walleye Fishing yeah. Facebook page. Yeah. Hit the admin up. That's Steve Paul. Cool. And um, we also have an email. Um, it's Tennessee Walleye Anglers at gmail.com. Tennessee and, uh, Walleye Anglers at gmail.com. You can email him as yeah, well. And you'll see that. That'll be on the Facebook page as well, the email. And then you can email me through there, and uh, I can try to help you out as much as possible. Um, but honestly, just like anything else, it's, you know, practice. You get out there and yeah. just do it over and over again, you know. They call it fishing, not catching for a reason. So. <laughs> That's a fact. Don't be afraid to fail, folks. Uh, the failure can be a great teacher. And uh, I appreciate y'all for tuning in. We will uh, we'll work out the, <laughs> the audio part, and we'll post this on um, our YouTube account. And uh, before I go, if you want to watch uh, Steve fishing, he took me out. Like I said, we did the uh, drop the tailgate video. Uh, go to uh, the TWRA um, YouTube account, or you can, you can Google search TWRA. Um, Drop the tailgate walleye, and it should pull up the, uh, the the fishing show that we did together. He shows techniques, planer boards, trolling, jigging, um, and we did that on a few different places. So it's it's, it's pretty good stuff there. Check it out. Uh, thank y'all for tuning in. Uh, good luck. Tight lines. God bless.